Welcome to Speak for Yourself from the Crib. Presented today, this segment by Popeye's Chicken Sandwich. All right, we got a great show planned for you. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley on a Tuesday, the day after Monday. All right, stick around. We have one of, if not the greatest defensive player in NFL history, just around the corner in our next segment. Ronnie Lott, we're going to pull up in his crib, talk some 49ers football, and has Tom Brady really replaced Joe Montana as the GOAT? Even later and better, you know who just won the NASCAR race in Darlington? Kevin Harvick. He's going to be in the house. Mm -hmm. We'll pull up in his crib and talk about Wednesday's race, NASCAR race. Kevin Harvick's going to join us, but we're going to start with the NFL as we like to do here. This is a show that leans into football and some relatively significant news in the NFL. Uh, As we've talked, and we'll bring in LeVar Arrington from his crib, but as we've talked the last few days, uh, the NFL has tabled, NFL owners have tabled the proposal to incentivize the hiring of minority coaches and GMs, the controversial suggestion of improving third round picks if you hire a black or minority head coach or general manager. That has been tabled, but a resolution has been passed. They approved the proposal that would prevent teams from blocking assistant coaches from interviewing for coordinator positions. And reportedly, the league also is making changes to the Rooney Rule, requiring even more minority candidates to be interviewed before a hire can be made. Progress has been made. I think Roger Goodell and Troy Vincent have done a good thing. I think the proposal that was tabled was created to create conversation and put pressure on NFL uh, ownership and executives. I think it was for Roger Goodell and Troy Vincent, the league, to say where they stood on the issue. But as I suggested uh, yesterday, Marcellus, and let's bring in LeVar Arrington on this conversation as well, there are layers to this conversation that I think the proposal that was tabled has given us an opportunity to discuss And one of them that I've been passionate about is NFL players, black players, hiring agents to represent them that are black. I think that would do a lot to empower executives and coaches. And if we're going to claim or we're going to complain that NFL ownership won't hire us to lead the teams and organizations as individual athletes, when you have your team or corporation built around Odell Beckham Jr. Inc. or Cam Newton Inc. Who do you hire? And so the question I'm going to ask you guys, Marcellus, a second-round pick, LeVar, the number two pick in the draft when he came out, do NFL players actually play a role in the lack of diversity among head coaches and general managers? Marcellus. Absolutely, they do. Um, And and I respect what you're saying. I got to give credence to that. Uh, How do you want someone to trust in you if you don't show that same trust in your own, show that same value? I think that goes a long way. Uh, But I also want to talk deeper to what's happening in the culture and the mindset of the athlete and use some numbers to support it, but also just the ideology that exists, this whole ball to you fall mentality that exists with the athletes. Now, there are two things at play right here. We know that 70 plus percent of the NFL is African-American on the field. But then when you look on the sidelines, let's just stay there. Of the 32 head coaches, 24 of them did not play football at the professional level. Now, of those 24, two of them are black in terms of Brian Flores and Mike Tomlin. So that's all we have of people of color, two of the 24. Why am I giving you those numbers? Because I'm going to give you the mindset now. A lot of my teammates, and we're talking about a population that is majority black, are going to ball till they fall. And you know what that means? If you really dive into what that mentality is, that they're going to exhaust all their options to try and stay on the field. Meanwhile, others, white players, whatever you want to say, outside the black culture is thinking maybe football on the field is not going to be a career for me. So then they transfer their mindset and energy into actually being on the sidelines or upstairs. Uh, Sean McVay actually talked about this. And Sean McVay is an interesting case because not only did he change his mindset to say, the only way I can be involved with professional football will be on the sidelines, 
but he also had nepotism and the networking. So think about how the black athlete is behind the eight ball when it comes to making that transition from, okay, my career on the field is over. Now I want to step on the sidelines, let alone upstairs as an executive. You are so far behind in that transition when you talk about where everyone else is because of their limitations. So in a sport where we say it's a meritocracy and we don't care who you are, big school, small school, whatever type of background you have, on the field is based on merit. But on the sidelines, there's more to it than just the merit. It's who made the quicker transition, who has the head start, who networks, as I like to say, work the net, built those relationships. So a guy who comes off the football field, whether it's the collegiate level or pro level, if he hasn't fully committed to being on that sideline, he's putting himself at a disservice. Yeah, as an active player, I say no. And, and the reason why I say no is players have their own challenges. I was one of those guys. As you mentioned, I was a number two overall draft pick. I, I selected a black agency. I had the Poston brothers, two black agents, as my representation because I believed in empowering one another and giving my own, my own people the opportunity to represent me. If I could do it all over again, I would make the decision to maximize my career. Careers can last from two to three years on average. You have two to three years to maximize your opportunity in the National Football League as a player and as an employee. That is not my concern to try to fight a battle to be able to place other people in, in an opportunity to get a head coaching job, a GM job, or an ownership level type, type of situation while I am trying to be the best player that I can possibly be. I don't think that that's fair to put that type of pressure and weight on someone who is spending their time trying to get employed and finally getting employed to actually put themselves in a position where they might have to, like for me, it, it compromised my career. In the end, I had a contract issue that derailed my career in Washington. So, and not saying that that's a color driven thing. I'm just saying for me, I'm going to hire who I believe is going to represent my interest the best. And I'm not attaching a color to that. And as far as, and again, just one last point to that, as far as looking at it as, Hiring an agent of the same race and background as me is going to make the difference in how agents or, or how owners view putting in uh, play, uh, people like GMs and head coaches. I think it's two entirely different conversations, and, and they would take place on two entirely different platforms. LeVar, I think you've argued your point very well. I, I don't want to criticize that, but I completely disagree with it. I think if you look across at white NFL players, they virtually all have white representation. I can't say that's a decision based on race. They're hiring who they believe trust can do the best job for them. I get that. But I also think we have a responsibility, particularly if we want to move up and elevate to be comfortable working with each other and empowering each other. And I do think we have a responsibility to do that. And I want to add this, and I meant to say this in the open. Read a Washington Post piece uh, this morning from Robert Klimko uh, that was put out around the NFL draft. For the first time in the history of the NFL, more than half of the first-round picks were represented by black agents. So perhaps there is some progress being made in terms of how we view ourselves, who we're empowering, who we trust, to represent our own little individual businesses. And I do think it would have an impact in terms of, look at the, across at the NBA and how Leon Rose is getting an opportunity to run the New York Knicks. Rob Palenka got an opportunity to run the Los Angeles Lakers. These are former agents. They have all sorts of interaction with ownership. Ownership gets comfortable with them, develops a level of respect for them, and then says, hey, I think this guy can run my team. And, and to me, if more black players were represented by black agents and ownership was dealing with these agents constantly, they would start to think, hey, maybe this guy could run my team, but also maybe I should hire someone 
who I think connects with this power agent. And again, Tom Condon, great friend of mine. He's from Kansas City, one of the great NFL super agents, one of the smartest guys I know. But, but just being in that position, representing a Peyton Manning and all the different guys he represented, it put him in position to earn the respect of some of the most powerful sports owners in the league. And if we can do that for more black agents, I think we would see a trickle-down effect in the executive wing, and I think eventually it would happen in the coaches in the coaching ring as well. But, but if we don't have the courage to hire our own and, and the belief to hire our own, I think it's hypocritical to insist that others hire us as well. So I think you argued your point well, uh, LeVar, but, but I disagree. Marcellus, you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, it's such a layered discussion, man. But look, David Ware, uh, who used to rep Barry Sanders, a sports attorney, uh, talked about how athletes always say things in, in nature of social awareness and social responsibility but then they have a plantation mentality when it comes to their own representation. Uh, you should dig deeper into what David Ware experienced in his career. And it's funny that some of the top agents right now, let's talk about Nicole Lynn, the double minority, a female and a black. Uh, you talk about her situation and she did her own research and of all the top agents, Demarius Bilbo or uh, David Mulageta, those guys who are the top black super agents right now, you know how many white clients they have? <laughs> None. Zero. Not a single white client. So this is what Whitlock is talking about that I agree with. If you want to show that value in yourself and that value in those who are of your likeness, it does have an effect on the entire landscape. Because what happens is, the Marius Bibble talked about how when he walks into a white quarterback's or a white office alignment's home and doesn't get that player, it's the same thing as a, a, a black head coach walking into a white general manager's office. He doesn't get that opportunity because we are not comfortable enough with our own. And it's a crazy mindset to think about that it's one thing to be a black super agent, but all your clients are black. But every one of these agents have been on record saying the real crossover, the real threshold is when we get the white player to buy into us. Not because of complexion or be deterred because of complexion, but because of merit. And if we don't have that crossover effect and we don't even show that same value within our own, then we know why we're in this dire situation right now. I think you got to be very careful when we start pointing to those type of of reasoning as to why we hire who we hire because it actually perpetuates the other side of the discussion if if, if you're talking about walking into the office of a black owned and black brand nfl franchise then the conversation dramatically is different and and the conversation is changed around when we talk about these people walking in and of color okay their, their, their best interest isn't being represented, but yet we see a white quarterback go with a white agent. Well, generally speaking, they're going into the office with a, a white owner as well. So that is the fundamental difference between the conversation points that we're having right now, is that you're not walking into an office with all black representation to do a deal with a black owner of an NFL franchise. That's not the reality here. So we got to be careful in saying, okay, this person of color is qualified. This m minority is qualified to represent my best interest. My best interest does not have a race connected to it. My best interest is my best interest. So we have to be careful in saying, okay, in order for us to be able to sit at the table, we have to empower our own in terms of my representation versus versus the merit of what your career represents and then having the Gotta conversation go, from there. Yep, yep. That, just got to be careful with it. Thank you. You know, <laughs> listen, we're going to continue this conversation. We got the rest of the week. It's Please. not going anywhere. We will Please. circle back. <laughs> but we got one of the greatest football players of all time who has a case that maybe he's the greatest defensive player of all time. Ronnie Lott from mm. his crib. Speak for yourself from the crib continues. More after this. That's my dog. 
Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Crib, presented by Hyundai, Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley. All right, we have a very special guest. We're going to go out to the Bay Area and be joined by a four-time Super Bowl champion, one of the greatest football mm. players in NFL history, Ronnie Lott. Uh, welcome to Speak for Yourself. And let's start with a relatively easy question. They, they okay. made it almost illegal to tackle in the NFL, Ronnie. And I want to know, could Ronnie Lott be Ronnie Lott in today's NFL where you have to, like, ask a wide receiver for permission before you tackle him? Mm. First, first of all, let me say this. Um, I love the game. And not only do I love the game, I love the new rules. And the reason I love the new rules is that um, you have to go find a way to hit in a different spot. The question is, man, which I think, and Barry Bonds once told me this when they changed the strike zone. I said, Barry, what'd you do? He goes, well, I went to work. I went to work. I went to work and to understand that the strike zone is different. I would go to work. And it's pretty simple when you think about going to work, man. And, 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 the, and the idea of what we've seen here recently in watching, you know, the Jordan, the last dance, he went to work. If you want to be a champion, you got to go to work, man. And, and, and one of the great things about hitting or about doing anything is that you got to find a new target. And I think one of the great things that we've seen so far is that guys have found a new way of attacking and getting after guys. So I enjoy the game. I still see some of them woo hits. And I still see some guys, you know, hitting really hard. <laughs> And uh, and so we're not I don't you know, the, the sad part is we f we focus on the things that people's I mean, I'm yesterday's news. <laughs> you know, when you think about guys who played in the era, no, you're, I not. Played, you're not yesterday. That's news. yesterday's news. Today, what we're looking at no, no, are guys listen. that are. No, I just want you to know they got guys right now that are phenomenal football players. And I have the utmost respect for how they go out and, 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 and not only play the game, but how they perfect the game. Let me ask you this, Ronnie. Pretend like we're off camera and I want what you would tell me in private. Is Ronnie Lott the greatest defensive back of all time? We're not on camera. Well, look, man, and I know this because I... I, I I played three different positions, and those three different positions that oh. I played, um, I tried to be the best. And the only reason I tried to be the best in those three different positions is that they gave me the opportunity and the privilege to try it. And so for me, you know, I've always said this, you got to exhaust every moment. And that's all I was trying to do is exhaust every moment. But to say that I'm one of the best ever as a defensive back, Hey, man, I'm very humbled by some of the people that have come before me and some of the people that will come after me. And uh, uh, I'm just I'm just I'm glad I'm in the conversation. I'm glad I'm in the conversation with Ed Reed. I'm glad I'm in the conversation with Deion Sanders. I'm glad I'm in the conversation with some of the guys that Rod Woodson. I'm glad I'm in, in the car. Kenny Easley I'm, to me, Kenny Easley. I'm glad I'm in the conversation because I have the ultimate respect for how he played the game. So there are some guys, Mel Blunt. I mean, I can go down, I mean, you know, I can go down the list and and you start to realize night train lane. You start to realize, I mean, there's some guys <laughs> that you just want to sniff them because that's how good they were. That's how great they were. And so yeah, right, I'm gonna all pass, of those guys I mentioned. I'm going to pass the baton. I'm going to pass the baton to Marcellus because you'll probably dodge my next question as well. But I just want to enter it into the mm. record, Marcellus, before you change the topic. He's the only guy, Pro Bowl, at three different positions. Corner, free safety, mm. strong safety. Rod Woodson, I think maybe Pro Bowl at two positions. Maybe Charles Woodson okay. as well, but no one else at three positions. One of the greatest defensive players, if not the greatest defensive player of all time. Marcellus. Yeah. Well, thanks for passing it to a guy who struggled to make the Pro Bowl <laughs> in just one position. And you know what? 
<laughs> Damn it, I'm still proud of it. Um, hey, Ronnie, being real, man, respect to you, you living legend, but how much did you benefit going every day to practice against one of the most potent offenses the NFL has ever seen? Talking about Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, and the architect, the coach, and Bill Walsh. Hey, man, to me, think, thinking of what you just said and knowing what you have to do against that group of guys every day, I, I, I tell people this, is that Jerry Rice, to me, is arguably our Michael Jordan. And if you watched him work every day from Monday through Saturday, and then, on, of course, on Sunday, we got him. We got to, you know, we were watching him. But from Monday through Saturday, just like Michael, he did everything. I mean, everything that you could possibly do to be great. And not only great, but the competitor of him was, hey, man, I'm going to get you. And, and, and not only am I going to get you, but I'm going to work you every day. And, and so you, you're absolutely right, man. Uh, uh, I benefited from... Bill Walsh, I benefited from all of those guys, but more importantly, I benefited from my coaches, you know, Ray Rhodes and George Seifert and those guys. And then my in the secondary, man, we had an incredible secondary. Eric Wright, Carlton Williamson, Dwight Hicks. That secondary in 84 went to the Pro Bowl, all of us. I don't know if anybody's ever done that, but all of us went because we had that kind of, I'm going to get you, or I'm going to top you, and, 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 and somebody else will come back and say, wait a minute, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to outdo you. And so we had mm. that camaraderie and that competition, as you pointed out, within the, within the locker room and within the group of guys. Well, let's, let's stick to that word competition because everyone, including you, is hearing the GOAT conversation. Everyone's saying Tom Brady. But in the spirit of competition... Where does Joe Montana land? Is he better? Is he the true GOAT? So I, 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 as I'm sitting here, I can tell you right now, man, Joe Money, I, it's hard for me to say that Tom Brady is better than Joe Money. And the reason why is that I just have watched so many times when I thought that there was no opportunity to win that we ended up winning. And Joe Money is just one of those kind of guys that I'm always going to bet on because there is something about the moment when you have to make it happen. I mean, obviously, Tom has done it time and time and time and time again as well. But he has also had the moments where it has cracked. And so when you got a guy like Joe who has been in those situations where he, it, he didn't, didn't allow it to crack, I'm going with Joe Money. Ronnie, I keep hearing you reference Michael Jordan. You watched the Last, Ch Last Dance documentary. I want to know from your perspective as a football player and a guy that made his bones in the 80s, what do you think of Michael Jordan's leadership style? Some people saying he was a bully. How do you think you would have responded to that, or was that the same kind of culture you guys had in football in the 80s? Hey, man, the one thing that I, when do you do you know how hard it is to win? Do you really understand how hard it is to get four? And, and, and by the way, we were trying to get three in a row, and I'm telling you, I'm still mad because we lost to the Giants. So winning is hard. And all Michael was saying to everybody, understand, even the greatest, it has to be such that you don't let nothing, nothing stay on the table. You got to eat it all. And that's one of the great things that we saw is that he said, hey, Detroit, I got to get stronger. I got to work. They're killing me. They're bumping me. The fact is, we all have moments like that where somebody is bigger than you, stronger than you, and then you find a way. And that's the bet to me, the, the beauty of all of it, man, to me, is that that kind of leadership is, like he said, I want everybody to do what I can do. And I'm telling you, Jerry, Jerry Rice would say the same thing. 
Joe Montana would say the same thing because those guys understand how hard it is to win. And, and winning for all of us is so tough, man. It is so tough. And to do what he was able to do three in a row, back to back, yeah, that, I'll smell, I can smell it, man. <laughs> That's, that stuff is good. That is good. That's some good. That is an incredible smell. That is an incredible smell. Only and, and by by the way, only he can say it. You know, only he can say mm. what that's, he's. And and so there's something about that that I marvel in it because when I first met him, I just thought about not him, but the spirit of who he is, man. And I'm just, um, I I admire his spirit, I admire his competition, but there are guys like that, like Larry and and Magic, and we saw so many guys that have, and and by the way, this hat I'm wearing is for a reason because you got my boy Steph and Draymond, and uh, and you know, and that that kid, um, Michael's son, you know, and so, so you you got some you got some you got some dogs right now up in uh in in San Francisco that will fight you, and 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 they love playing. So I can't wait for them to get back on the court. And, and legend, let's talk about your passion. Uh, saw you last at at your award ceremony, Lot Impact Trophy Award, and let's just talk about your passion for counseling athletes and making that transition into the business world. You've had a successful transition, obviously, but talk about your passion and making sure that other guys can do as well. You know, life is about how somebody says something to you to help you get better. Um, There are many moments where somebody has whispered in my ear, like Deacon Jones, when I was a young kid, said, hey man, be the best. Or Jim Brown, whispering in my ear, man, you know, you can do this, or mean Joe Green. And my point is is that you can go down the list of people giving you wisdom all the time. Even now, as, as, as you live the rest of your life, you gotta find wisdom. And so one of the things that I've always said is, man, I, I've seen guys give me so much. I've seen guys that sat down with me and told me stories and shared with me the things that I should be doing in my life. Gene Washington sitting down, Jimmy Johnson sitting down with me. And you think about those guys, some of the greatest 49ers ever, but they would sit down and talk to me about the game, about life. And so it's important for all of us to take on that responsibility to make sure that we pass it forward, man. That is, that is the greatest gift that we can give another human being is ourselves. Ronnie, thank you so much for taking the time. It was great to have you. you. Go Warriors, go 49ers, except when they play the Chiefs. All right, we got to keep it moving. Rick Buka's around the corner. (laughs) Right, right. We're going to get to the bottom of this whole pizza controversy (laughs) and and the Utah Jazz and Michael Jordan. Who side you on, Michael Jordan or the pizza delivery guy, the assistant manager? He's got his side of the story. We'll get to the bottom of that with Rick Buecher. Speak for Yourself from the Career, presented by Hyundai. More after this. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Career, presented by Hyundai. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley on a Tuesday afternoon. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's roll out to the Bay Area again and be joined by our NBA analyst, Rick Buecher. Rick, thanks for coming back. All right, listen, there's this whole pizza controversy <laughs> engulfing engulfing the strong word but engulfing Michael <laughs> Jordan in the last dance documentary it was argued that the flu game in Utah the infamous game where Jordan scored 39 some odd points or whatever despite having the flu was actually food poisoning Tim Grover Jordan's trainer told a story about five guys showing up to deliver the pizza and it's insinuated that Jordan was intentionally food poisoned by this pizza. Uh, there's also a story uh, by Jason Hare, I think the, do- the guy that put the documentary to Gary together, that Jordan actually spit on the pizza so no one else would eat it. Well, now the assistant general manager of the pizza place who said he made the pizza himself 
has said Jordan's story is crap. The story in The Last Dance is crap. He personally made the pizza. He's a Bulls fan. He named a kid after MJ. He says he bet on the Chicago Bulls. There was nothing wrong with the pizza. Said when he walked into the building, you could smell the cigar smoke. Basically insinuates Michael Jordan was up late drinking and smoking cigars, threw some pizza on top of it, and that's why he was sick. It had nothing to do with anybody intentionally food poisoning. Marcellus, whose side you on? Who do you believe here? Michael Jordan or the pizza general manager? I believe the pizza man. Uh, the pizza man wholeheartedly is telling the truth. And there are two factors you have to consider that makes Michael Jordan look bad in this situation. One is LeBradford Smith. You guys remember LeBradford Smith and that conversation that Michael Jordan had about him, how he made up that LeBradford Smith told me, hey, nice game, and how he gave him the business the next night after. And you learn pretty quickly not to take Michael Jordan for every single word, that your airness is sometimes full of a lot of hot air because he's not telling you exactly the literal gospel right here. So that was one sign. And when I heard this story in real time, I immediately was thinking, this doesn't sound right. Five guys show up to the hotel room of Michael Jordan? What happened to all the security detail? What happened to you needed a password just to get on the elevator? You mean they got by security five deep to deliver one pizza? Stop it. That makes no sense. Look, I was nowhere near Michael Jordan. I dare you come up to my hotel room for the San Diego Chargers, let alone Michael Jordan. Your airness. So I didn't believe it as soon as I heard the number five. All this is, this wasn't a flu game. This was a full game. Dude ate a large piece of Solo with a bunch of drink in him and them cigars hit. That's a bad cocktail, man. Jordan Lyon, bro. I believe he had food poisoning. And I believe that he got it from the pizza. Look, I spent some time in Salt Lake City during that time. It was difficult. You're suggesting that if he had food poisoning or if he did get food poisoning, the pizza manager is suggesting if he had food poisoning, he got it from someplace else. Look, he was lucky enough to find that particular pizza in Salt Lake City at that time of night. This erases the fact that people were calling it the flu game. And that was a euphemism for he went to Vegas, whether it was Wendover, Nevada, that's right across the border from, from Utah or, or Vegas itself. The fact of the matter is, he was in his hotel room. The pizza manager verified that. Look, you're looking outside of your door, and you see, okay, two guys in uniform. There could have been multiple people. It could have been hotel security out there along with the pizza guys. Tim Grover gets the number wrong in terms of the guys that are delivering it. Reality is, there were two guys delivering that pizza and that's one more than I've ever had show up when they're delivering me pizza. So there was something unique going on here. <laughs> I don't know that they purposely poisoned him. I don't believe that. But this guy's two, three weeks into the job and he's saying, I did everything perfect. Dude, you haven't been making pizza that long. You could have screwed up or there could have been something in that pizza. <laughs> I look at the way that Jordan looked in that game and I'm buying... That's not that's not drink. I mean, how much do you have to drink to sweat like that no. and to be hung over the next day at 7.30, at 7.30 tip, I am not buying it. Look like food poisoning to me. I'm rolling with Rick, it. Rick, I, I completely disagree with you because, one, the insinuation is that these guys intentionally damaged Michael Jordan. And I just don't buy that. That's way too high risk. You know, Kobe went through the same game. thing in Sacramento. What if he gets sick? What if he, what if he gets sick and dies? Seriously, when you talk about food poison, or something, it just ain't worth the risk. I just don't buy. And, and do I believe I he potentially had food poisoning? Absolutely. You you throw some cigars and some cognac down you and a large pizza at 3 a.m. when you're out athletically competing. Yeah, you, that that is how you get food poison. You throw all that different stuff into your system. And Michael Jordan, like a lot of young people, I used to be young once. You always think you're bulletproof. You think you can drink, eat, and do whatever the hell you want. And eventually you pay a price, and he paid a price. Michael Jordan clearly, and the, Tim Grove, they're not telling the truth here. I don't like it because I also don't like just the insinuation that these two young people in Utah did something to intentionally harm Michael Jordan. 
That's a pretty si significant allegation no, no, no. just to throw out there willy-nilly when you're sitting around. And because, trust, I think we've all, I can certainly speak for myself. I'm going to speak for Marcellus. We've all been overserved and thrown some food on top of it on the way home, some Taco Bell, sure. and been Ooh. sick afterwards. That ain't on Taco Bell. Ooh. That's on us. To be clear, I'm not <laughs> saying he was purp purposely poisoned. I don't believe that. I don't believe that they purposely put something in there. But the way he looked, I've had it. I've had it. I know what that feels like. If the team doctor is saying this was food poisoning, look, they could have said it was the flu. They could have said it was all kinds of things. That's where they decided to go. And so, I again, and this is to Marcellus's point about, like, he hasn't, you know, the LeBradford Smith example. There was always a purpose behind what Michael did, and it was a motivation for himself. This would have been abdication of, I'm going to go get the job done. This would have been an excuse. It would have been the first time ever that Michael Jordan did something like that, unless this was simply exactly what happened. Michael Jordan wouldn't have survived the social media era. We would have called fraud on all this a long time ago. Man, look, he, he stokes the fire of his mystique. Hey, we saw it through 10 episodes. All he does is put fuel to the fire of his mystique. Reality is somewhere different than what the legend of Michael Jordan is. It's okay. I'm fine with it. I don't understand why everyone plants that flag that everything he did was perfect, authentic, and genuine. Oh, the dude that. made up stories, and he made up this story, and he did it because he knew it would sound better, like a lot of his stories. Keep them coming, MJ. They're entertaining. <laughs> All right, we got to keep it rolling. It's time for some rubbing and racing. Kevin Harvick just won his 50th NASCAR race, moving him closer to immortality. We're going to go out to his crib. Speak for yourself from the crib, presented by Hyundai. More after this. Well, fans, NASCAR is back. Tonight on FS1, we've got Xfinity Series racing. Then tomorrow night, we finish up at Darlington, the Toyota 500, live and in prime time, only on FS1. And Sunday, we're back on Fox for the Coca-Cola 600, live in Charlotte. That's my dog. All right, welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Crib. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley. Speak for Yourself presented by Hyundai. Time for us to pull up at Kevin Harvick's crib. Kevin Harvick, the winner of this past Sunday's Real Heroes 400. Kevin, 6 million viewers watching at home. That's a Daytona 500-like number, but no one in the grandstands. What was that experience like for you, racing without anybody in the grandstands? Yeah, well, for me, it was it was um, the most unique and, and really caught my attention the most when I got out after the race because as, as a driver, you know, during the race, there's really not that much difference of what you see and don't see in the grandstands other, other than a flashbulb. You know, and, and so getting out after that race and have all that excitement and enthusiasm built up and nobody to share it with, I, I realized how much we actually feed off of the crowd and the things that you say, the things that you do. And, and uh, it was very awkward for me after the race because, you know, I didn't I didn't really know what what to do because there wasn't anything, any anything to feed off of. So uh, not being able to see my guys uh, faces behind their mask uh, on pit road, nobody in victory lane. It was a it was a very different uh, situation, but I think as as you look at the job that NASCAR did and and everybody in the industry to to get our sport back on track, uh, they did a great job keeping everybody safe, and and we were able to go back to work. Look, it's a victory you'll never forget for a lot of reasons. You guys, NASCAR, helped bring us back a little bit of normalcy as we try to recover from this pandemic, and for you individually, your fiftieth career win. Only 14 drivers have done that. What's it like to be in that elite company? Well, there's there's definitely, I feel a sense of responsibility there when you put your name next to Ned Jarrett's and, um, you know, the likes of, of the Jarrett family. Uh, Junior Johnson, obviously, is is the other. And those those guys are both Hall of Famers and, and both have meant so much to this sport. So the first thing that that I did was ask myself, have you done enough to live up to the expectations of what those guys did for the sport and, and carrying that responsibility uh, forward and, and making sure that you remember that. So it's, it's, a, it's a good reality check for me. 
Um, obviously, I've been very fortunate to be competitive and, and win a bunch of races, but there's there's way more responsibility uh, to our sport uh, than, than just re- winning races. Are, are we going to be able to hand it off uh, you know, to the next generation of guys uh, so that they can carry it forward? So it definitely brought a lot of that thought process to, to me as, as uh, I hear people talking about those names. Now, you're right back at Darlington tomorrow night on FS1, Toyota 500. And you're driving the same car that you drove on Sunday. What went into that decision and what are the risks involved? Yeah, that's old school. We, we, we normally, it takes about a month and a half to, to turn the car around. Uh, the guys uh, have been in a unique situation at the shop with all the new uh, no qualifying procedures. And they didn't work for a few weeks uh, because of, of everybody being locked out of the shop during this pandemic. So um, it also helps us catch up. Uh, you know, from a performance side, you're very comfortable with that car and feel like you can make good adjustments on it. But it also gives us a little bit of padding as we go into these next several races, racing Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, uh, to to have a little cushion on, on your car count and not put the guys in the shop in a bind. So, uh, look, for, for me, they, they all fit the same, right? And, and you got to have faith in, in what the guys are, are bringing to the racetrack. All my seats are custom. My dashers are the same. Steering wheels are the same. So uh, that's what they wanted to do. And and I'm a team guy. So uh, whatever they say, I'm I'm buying into to what they say. And and let's let's go do it again. Now you mentioned no qualifiers for this Wednesday's race. So the top 20 finishers are inverted. So that puts you in a 20th spot. You have any yeah. issue of how NASCAR is handling this? Look, we were the points leader going into this, and, and typically during a rainout or some of these instances, they would line the field up by points. And you know, I think everybody just assumed that they were going to do that. But I think there's a there's a there's a responsibility here to make this entertaining because we are in the entertainment business, and we we need to make sure that it doesn't look the same on pit road every time with the same guys having a first pit stall, the same guys starting up front. So in in this particular instance, I'm I'm for it. I think it's going to add some excitement and, and definitely some, you know, we've already got some speaking points and talking points uh, for, for the media and the fans to talk about before we even get to the race. So if, if we can create an event uh, before we even have the event and, and some talking points around it, uh, that's, that's always going to be a good thing for the show. Kevin, you mentioned old school and turning the car around that quickly, but Kevin Harvick and all these racers Four races in 11 days, that's really old school. What have you done to prepare yourself for this kind of workload? Yeah, well, I tried to start preparing myself as, as we got into, you know, this, this, this break. And, you know, I've, I've tried to ride my road bike uh, a lot more than, than I ever had before. It was, was really a goal of mine to try to uh, do in the past. And, and now I, I just told myself, I said, you got you to do something different to make yourself be mentally prepared for whatever's in front of you, uh, be physically prepared. So, you know, I've tried to, um, you know, put some, some serious miles in on the road bike. I've tried to become a better runner. And then I've got a seven-year-old and a two-year-old here that I have to entertain as well. So uh, really, that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the motivator in the workout. Hmm. So my seven-year-old and I, we, we've been, uh, we, I make him run uh, two miles every morning. So I, I go with him. And, and so we've just, we've tried to stay active. And, and the most important thing, uh, for us is, is hydration. Um, uh, I, I do a few different things. I, I use a lot of, uh, red light therapy with, with the juve machine. Um, and, you know, just try to try to take care of yourself from, from a fitness standpoint as, as I would, whether I'm in or out of the car, uh, from a cardio standpoint. Kevin, we're out of time. Thank you so much. On your way out, I'm a degenerate gambler. Hey, brother. I'm going to be betting on Wednesday. Give me a thumbs up if I should double down on Kevin Harvick or not and win some money that way on my Fox Bet app. Give me a thumbs up if I should bet on Kevin Harvick. Look, we got to keep it moving. I'm never, I'm never Uncle Jimmy's. Myself. That's right. <laughs> Around oh, the man. corner, we'll get his thoughts on Michael Jordan. Speak for yourself from the crib, presented by Hyundai. More after this. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Crib, presented by Hyundai. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley, the day before hump day. All right, let's roll out to Uncle Jimmy's crib. Get his you thoughts know. on Michael Jordan and the pizza Jason controversy and engulfing Air Jordan. What do you think of this whole pizza controversy? Was he food poisoned or did he just drink himself into, was it alcohol poisoning? <laughs> 
<laughs> Look, man. <laughs> hey, man, I, 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 Uncle Jimmy just going to keep it a blunt 40, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you, man. <laughs> this is the only part of the documentary I did not like. If you remember, I texted you as soon as this part came up. All right, man, Uncle Jimmy been in law enforcement for 17 years. I've been divorced happily five times, okay? I know a lie when I hear a lie, okay? It's one thing I'm qualified. It's telling a lie, okay? When y'all told me Michael Jordan turned chalky white, I knew it was a damn lie, okay? All right? <laughs> Look here. At that time in life, Michael Jordan could leave fingerprints on charcoal. Ain't no way in hell that man was talking no chalky white. Look like somebody sprayed armor all all over him to me. All right, we'll see the you man tomorrow. Was talking white. We'll